It says recording. Did you hit to the cloud? I did. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks everyone for joining us um, uh, as a part of the Don't Feed the Algae uh, uh, webinar series. We have been um, doing these now since the beginning of May, as you can see from the screen here. And um, the, the theme overall, what we're trying to get across is that um, the cause of algae blooms and the solutions to algae blooms are very much um, uh, intricate and connected to every single one of the issues that are top tier issues for St. John's Riverkeeper as we try to um, uh, retain and maintain a voice for the St. John's to defend and advocate for its protection. Um, when we started in May, we launched with just basics about algae blooms in the St. John's how they form and what's unique about our area. We talked about flooding, hurricane storms, resiliency in the second presentation really went into individual actions and more, um, uh, I would say a focus on our yards um, and how, how those impact algae blooms. Last, uh, uh, the end of June, we covered sewage sludge and how the sewage sludge land application impacts the formation of algae blooms in the St. John's River. And today our focus is on um, the Ocklawaha River and how freeing the Ocklawaha River also contributes to um, uh, the capacity for the St. John's to heal and protect itself against the threat of algae bloom growth. And so just one sort of unique way of looking at the issue of don't feed the algae. Um, if you want to mark your calendar, every other Wednesday we have a, a focus and um, we added two more dates in August. So uh, feel free to join us on an upcoming webinar for Don't Feed the Algae. Uh, next slide. There is a bit of delay for some reason. <laughs> it happens. What we're going to start off today, though, um, uh, in understanding St. John's Riverkeeper and who we are, um, again, we're an advocacy organization that focuses on um, defending and advocating for uh, protection of the St. John's. And so, again, all of the issues that we work on are going to be connected to that. The ways that we do that are through um, education, advocacy, um, advocating for policy solutions, investigating pollutions, um, uh, and then raising awareness. And that's something that we've been doing. Um, next slide. Uh, uh, when talking about the Akalaha River, um, <clears throat> for years now and so connecting it to how algae blooms form is something that unique that we're <coughs> that we'll be doing today we're going to start off at the top of the agenda with just understanding the basics of algae because that's really going to feed directly into how we can connect it to the Akawaha river and then at the end of the presentation we're going to um uh it, explain how you can find out more about where algae blooms have been spotted this summer, um, whether or not they're toxic, how to report them and things like that so that we can all stay connected on um, where we're at with algae blooms right now. Sorry. So I want to jump right into understanding algae. Um, I know many of you have attended our presentations so far in this series, so you've heard um, this spiel, so I'm going to make it really quickly, but something that's important to understand about algae bloom formation. Algae blooms are that visible green, um, uh, uh, well, we call it the green monster in the St. John's River, um, but they look slimy, um, but sometimes they even look, uh, uh, we say like filamentous, like they have little hairs. And algae blooms can both be naturally occurring or they can be toxic. You don't always know just from looking at it. So there are a lot of things to keep in mind in understanding how algae blooms form and then how to avoid exposure to algae blooms that we just like to cover at the top of the presentation before we get into the heart of the issue. One of the ways um, that algae blooms form is through excessive contributions of either nitrogen or phosphorus um, uh, and both of them, when they come into contact with our water column, when they subsist there, and then when the right um, atmospheric conditions come into play to allow those excessive nutrients um, to be able to grow and feed and bloom. Um, those atmospheric conditions will include um, adequate sunlight, 
uh, warm temperatures and then um, slow moving water or wind. So we might have an excessive thunderstorm that we have in these summer months. Um, we'll get a lot of excess runoff from um, from our roads, from our yards, and, and all the sources um, of, of uh, excessive nutrients that occur. It'll run into the river and then wind might slow down. You'll have an area like a small tributary or a shoreline in a lake um, that starts to, to see this sort of growth of algae blooms um, happening because you just had that sunlight, the warm temperature, and then slow moving water or wind all happen with the excessive um, uh, uh, nutrients, next slide, and that's gonna, gonna basically create the conditions for an algae bloom. At St. John's River Keeper, we like to start at the top, which is not just how to avoid exposure and how to report algae blooms, but really trying to advocate for the policies that will stop the pollution at its source. So stop the excessive levels of nutrients from entering our river in the first place. That's going to be the, the best thing that we can do, the best way to utilize our time. But in addition, um, we do have to, to caution everyone when you see um, that green slime in the water, you should avoid exposure. And I'll talk about some of the health risks next. next. But then also we, we need to um, uh, report it, test it, and, and monitor it because that's going to be um, uh, the best way for us to um, know where it's at and to be able to exploit it, uh, 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 avoid exposure in those ways. Next slide. And then just to finish, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily understand what it means to avoid exposure to um, algae. Um, it not only means avoiding potential uh, to ingest algae, which you can do if you're on a boat um, and, and or water skiing and water splashing up around you, if you're in a kayak and water splashing up around you, if you see an algae bloom, steer away and avoid that. But you can also um, come into contact with it through inhalation. Um, there is an aerosol component to algae blooms. And so for those of us that go running along the river, if there's an active algae bloom nearby, um, that's a, a good reason to avoid running near uh, algae blooms. Really just avoiding being nearby and having those moments where you're um, uh, inhaling um, in a, a, a more profound way than, than normal um, to make sure that, that you're avoiding potential exposure that way. Because we do see there's evidence of long-term neurological issues for people that have come into contact with algae blooms extensively throughout their life. Um, we uh, recently had a, a film that we showed um, that kind of documented um, some of the new science surrounding links to uh, Alzheimer's and Lou Gehrig's disease with people that have had um, exposure to um, uh, cyanotoxin um, from, from algae blooms. You also want to make sure that your animals and pets are not exposed to um, algae blooms. Keep them away. If you have a, a lakefront or waterfront property and there's an algae bloom, you don't want them coming into contact with it. And if you fish, don't go fishing near the algae blooms because you don't want to consume fish that have been in an area with algae blooms. When you see the reduction in, in um, oxygen that is a result of algae bloom um, uh, uh, activity within a lake or waterway, you often see uh, fish kills associated with it nearby. So you don't want to potentially ingest fish that were, were in that um, sort of situation because um, of the potential contamination to yourself. Next slide. So in today's presentation, um, really just want to jump into um, the heart of, again, connecting the dots of how algae forms, the causes, the, the reasons we need to avoid it, and then what we can do as a potential um, solution um, to see reductions in algae blooms by talking about the Akuaha River. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Reinemann to discuss um, that topic. Thank you, Shannon, and thank you all again for joining us today. Um, you know, this is an exciting topic because restoring the Akalaha River and reconnecting Silver Springs, the Akalaha, and the St. John's is one of the most important restoration projects for the St. John's. And it's a solution not only to um, a decrease, uh, our river's decreased ability to filter out pollution, but also restoring our fisheries in our 100 mile estuary. 
So I want, if you don't take anything away from today, the one important thing is the restoration of the Akawaha is one of the most important water quality projects for Northeast Florida. And it's important we work together to make sure that, that this river is restored. Um, if, you, if you love the St. John's, if you love Silver Springs, or other springs of the Aqua it's critically important. So we'll talk about that today. So thank you for joining us. So for those of you that may not know where the Aqua River is, the Aqua River, um, the confluence of the Aqua and the St. John's is just north of Lake George. Let me see if I can find my corner. But it's Lake George is just um, south of the Red Arrow there. Lake, and then if you go north, you can see where the Aqua naturally met the St. John's River. Unfortunately, it was dammed in 1968 as part of the failed Cross Florida Barge Canal. And so that natural connection was severed and there's a pool behind the dam that is causing water quality issues as well as it's an artificial lake. It doesn't um, function as a natural lake. So it has to be drained every three to four years. And every time that's drained, it causes water quality issues for the St. John's River but it also gives us a glimpse into what a naturally flowing Akawaha would mean to the springs that are buried beneath the pool, as well as the St. John's. So it meets the St. John's about 100 miles inland, right at the beginning of the St. John's River estuary. So the last 100 miles of the St. John's is an important estuary, like the largest estuary in the state of Florida. And there's a very critical balance of salt and fresh water we'll be talking about so by restoring the connection of the Akawa to the St. John's, it brings these um, things into balance and the benefits are to water quality as well as to wildlife and fisheries is absolutely astounding. So again, when we talk about Akawaha restoration, it's more than just the Akawaha River. It reconnects Silver River, which is this, the largest freshwater spring of the St. John's River system. And, and when it reconnects it to the St. John's and through the estuary, it connects that fresh water source to the Atlantic Ocean and actually has benefits um, to saltwater fishing in the Atlantic Ocean. So it's not a local project, it's truly a project of regional significance. So first let's talk about saltwater intrusion. Um, unfortunately, we have seen saltwater intrusion from the Atlantic Ocean move further and further upstream, um, and that's due to several things. We have deepened and straightened the St. John's River. In fact, they're dredging right now. When you deepen the river, you create a super highway for the Atlantic Ocean to go further upstream, and so that saltwater wedge goes further south. The green there is saltwater moving south, the, the blue is freshwater coming from upstream in the St. John's. We've also seen sea level rise is real, it's happening now, and so that combined with the dredging has driven more salt water further upstream. Also when you overuse the aquifer, the St. John's River is a spring-fed river, and we're seeing a reduction of spring flow due to overuse of our aquifer, and so that robs the St. John's River of fresh water, so it, it sucks more salt water in. The river is extremely flat, like Florida, so when you take fresh water out, um, whether it's reduction of the aquifer or potential water withdrawals, like are being discussed in central Florida, when you remove that fresh water, you pull more salt water in. And so this is a problem to the St. John's because as it gets saltier, you start losing your freshwater wetlands, your freshwater grasses, the submerged aquatic vegetation. We're seeing these important uh, ecological um, features disappearing at alarming rates and it's due to that saltwater intrusion as well as development and other things. But it also damages and kills submerged trees. Um, the forested floodplains, forested wetlands are some of the most value, valuable um, biofilters in the St. John's and you're seeing more of those um, freshwater trees literally getting burned by that saltwater intrusion. So when we lose these grasses, when we lose these submerged um, trees as well as aquatic vegetation, not only do we lose important habitat for our fisheries, we lose biofiltration. We, the river loses its ability to filter out the pollution that's going in. And so by restoring the Akawaha, you actually can help bring more fresh water into the system to replenish those wetlands and grasses 
which should create more filtration to prevent algae blooms like this one on the St. Johns River. So it's critical that not only do we stop pollution at its source, as Shannon mentioned earlier, but we also restore the river's ability to filter out the pollution that's going in. And that's the one of the many benefits of the Aqualaha restoration. So first, it increases um, freshwater flow to the St. Johns. Right now, there's about 20 springs that are drowned out beneath the pool that aren't flowing naturally as well as there's a high amount of evaporation on the pool when the water levels are up. And so by looking at the data that's come out of the, sci the science that's been um, put together over about two decades during the drawdowns, um, the Water Management District predicts there's about 150 million gallons of fresh water every single day that would be restored naturally to the St. John's. And so that fresh water can read that freshwater influx will help offset the saltwater intrusion. Um, in addition, you'll see better temperatures. When a free flowing river is turned into a lake, the temperatures as well as dissolved oxygen are negatively altered. And so by restoring the natural connection of Silver Springs, restoring the 20 springs underneath the pool and having that natural flow instead of it being um, behind a dam, you're actually reducing temperatures. And so when you have, um, as Shannon mentioned, warmer water leads to more um, algae outbreaks. And so these, this temperature, um, clearer and clearer water is extremely important and something that is very difficult to get artificially in a way that this restoration would provide. Another issue with the pool is the reservoir now, the pool behind the dam is 50 years old and they get, more problematic as they age. In fact, this photo was taken at a boat ramp back in June of this year, right after a drawdown. And the drawdowns are supposed to clear out the, these invasive um, vegetation, but unfortunately, they're, it's still, it's not doing its job. And so when you see vegetation like this out in the Aqualaha behind the dam, it's restricting access and you're seeing more um, spraying for um, uh, pesticides and herbicides for this. And so all of this adds kind of a double whammy to the algae situation, because not only are you getting the herbicides in, in the river, you're also getting the dying vegetation that releases more nutrients into the system. And so this, these are things that all add up to a very messy um, addition of pollution into the St. John's. But let's focus on the positive. By restoring the Akalaha, the numbers are very clear. And this is, these numbers are based on decades of science by federal and state agencies. And the one we talked about so far is the 150 million gallons of wa um, water that's added back to the St. John's River system. And so, and that's provided as, in natural pulses as nature intended. So it's of critical importance um, and what that natural flow will also do is help restore forested floodplain below the dam. So below the dam, between the dam and the, and the St. John's River, the forested floodplain there is, is it's, it's not getting enough fresh water to function as it should. And so by this, restoring this flow, it restores about 700, I mean, sorry, 7,500 acres a forested floodplain that again is extremely valuable as far as biofiltration, as well as there's about 8,000 acres of what should be forested floodplain beneath the pool that was cut down to, to make way for the dam. And so all in all, there's about 15,000 acres of cypress forest floodplain, which is some of the best biofilters available, it will improve not only water quality, but also provides more habitat for wildlife and more flood protection. There's also 20 lost springs that will be uncovered beneath the pool as the restoration comes back into play. There'll be millions of dollars saved um, in repairs that are backlogged as well as the spraying and the artificial maintenance of the pool that has major um, water quality issues. And it'll provide um, the it'll restore pattern, migratory patterns for many fish, both endangered and threatened, that will help not only in the Akawaha and Silver Springs area, but in the estuary of the St. John's. Um, not to mention the warm water refuge in the wintertime for manatees up into Silver Springs. 
So when you look at all of these different pieces of the puzzle, the numbers are quite compelling. They provide a lot of, of environmental value, as well as they create many new outdoor recreational opportunities that create economic value, and as well as more fishing opportunities, a more diverse biodiversity and diverse fishing opportunity. So if you're more interested in learning about the environmental impacts and also the economic, which we won't go in today since we're talking about algae, go to freetheakawaha.com to learn more. There's a green and gold report that goes into the detailed numbers based on the data. Now let's get back to the St. John's River. So just to go through the, the benefits specifically the St. John's, um, this is so important for us to know. Um, we probably get asked, you know, several times a week, you know, you're the St. John's River Keeper, why are you talking about the Akawaha? Well, the Akawaha is the largest tributary to the St. John's. So by restoring it, the benefits are just as great to the St. John's River as they are to the Akawaha. And this is why. The restoration, as we talked about, the 8,000 acres of forested wetlands that are stressed below the dam, as well as the 75 acres of forested wetlands that are currently submerged under the pool. And I apologize, I got those numbers backwards a while ago. But it's 15, 000, more than 15,000 acres of restored freshwater forested wetlands, as well as the water quality improvement, the benefit that we get not only from the biofiltration capacity of those wet, the forested wetlands, but also the benefit of the fresh water restoring wetlands and submerged grasses in the St. Johns River. And, and so, and that's driven by the offset of that saltwater intrusion. By increasing the resiliency of the St. John's, the St. John's River's ability to push back that saltwater wedge, not only do we get the water quality filtration benefit, those restored wetlands and submerged grasses are sponges for excess floodwaters. And so it truly makes the St. John's River more resilient, and then it restores habitat for our fisheries and endangered species. In addition to opening up those migratory patterns for like American eel and American shad, it, it, all, and it also provides habitat in those restored wetlands and grasses. Um, most of the fish species that are recreationally fished or commercially in the St. John's River estuary, they depend on that freshwater saltwater connection on different parts of their life cycle. And so we really need to make sure that saltwater species have access to freshwater um, and it's close by and this restoration will make that happen. And so the fishing opportunities and that restoration downstream, in the Akawa, downstream of the Akawaha confluence with the St. John's um, will truly be exciting and provide more opportunity for economic opportunities because more people will not only come to fish, they'll also come to explore springs and, and trails and different outdoor opportunities available in this area. So again, just want to underscore the fact that this is a restoration not only of regional significance, but of statewide significance. Nowhere else in the state of Florida is there a project that provides such an amazing large scale restoration of bringing back cypress um, for forest, forest, as well as reconnecting Silver Springs, freeing the 20 springs, and providing significant habitat, water quality, restoration, and it's one that's gotten national recognition. It was just recently um, identified as one of the most endangered rivers by American Rivers due to the fact that this restoration project is being held back by a dam that basically serves no purpose. It was built for the Cross Florida Barge Canal, which failed, and it's been artificially maintained for basically a place to fish, which I understand if I grew up fishing I'm on the Rodman Pool with my grandfather, I'd want to protect it too. And if it was a naturally functioning ecosystem, we may not have, be having this conversation today. But the problem is every day that dam is in place, it's damaging Silver Springs, the 20 springs underneath it, the Akawaha, and the St. Johns River. And by restoring it, you improve fishing in the entire region. And so the focus is improvements on a regional basis. Um, but unfortunately, this project has been held hostage for decades by local interest. And so if you only look at the pool itself, and you're not having this discussion of the larger, bigger regional benefit, you're not engaging all of the stakeholders. And so it's a time that we are working 
with advocates, with stakeholders, with agencies across the state and with in, across the region to make sure we're taking, looking at this from a regional perspective and factoring in all of the science, all of the benefits. And fortunately, there is a, a large amount of science. It could fill up this room right now if we had it all printed out. And it's very clear. This, the evidence is there that this project is, is one that provides significant benefit. There's a strong economic return on investment. And this restoration partnered with a wonderful outdoor recreational plan will truly not only restore the Silver River, the Akalaha, and the St. John's, it will put, put Northeast Florida from Lake George, Wallaca, Palatka, all the way up to the Atlantic Ocean on the map for outdoor recreation, even beyond what it's already known for. And so that's why it's so important that we have this conversation wherever you are in Northeast Florida, Central Florida, or if you're down in the headwaters of the St. John's and you like to kayak, you like to fish, um, you wanna to come to a tournament, all of these things will be enhanced by this restoration if we work together to make it a reality. So how do you get involved? Um, one is, um, first step is tuning in today and really understanding, excuse me, the benefits to the St. John's River. We have to make sure that we're having this conversation. We have to make sure that every elected official from Marion County to Volusia County, Putnam, Clay, St. John's, Duval, everyone that's involved, as they understand the benefits of this and the value of those benefits. Um, also participate in our social media campaign. You know, sadly, we're all spending too, many, too much time now isolated for one another, but we can connect together and work on these issues through social media, as well as we can connect our advocacy efforts. And so you can go to Free the Akawaha Facebook page, say the um, St. John's River Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, and connect and use these tools um, to help us spread the word. You can join our coalition at freetheakawaha.com. Um, and there's tools there where you can host virtual movie, movie, movie viewings. If you have not seen uh, Matt Keens and Margaret Tolbert's Lost Springs, it's a fantastic documentary during the 2016 drawdown where it truly paints the picture of the restoration of the Akawaha that supports the details we've discussed today in regards to the St. John's. Um, and, and we're happy to you know, have conversations like this um, as an added you know, component to those type of movie screenings. And then stay tuned for action alerts. We are working with the state, um, state agencies as well as federal agencies on how we can make this a reality but we really have to build on the science and, and, and focus on building political will to make this project happen based on decades of science. So stay tuned, sign up for action alerts at stjohnsriverkeeper.com, actually .org, sorry. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to Shannon to talk a little bit more specifically about algae and then we will answer any questions or just have, um, have your comments at the end of the session. But thank you so much for tuning in and working with us to free the Akawaha. Shannon? I feel like I need to take a minute <laughs> and, just, and just pause and take all that in. Um, Lisa, thank you so much for, for that content, um, for linking how a free Akawaha River really will help us uh, to, to not feed the algae. Um, I'm gonna finish off today with just a few quick resources for folks to understand how to identify an algae bloom, avoid it, and then report it. Next slide. Um, so that you know where to report it and you also know what's going on with algae blooms right now. Luckily, we haven't gotten that many reports, at least to um, here to us uh, at the office in the last few weeks. Um, and, uh, uh, and the FDEP, who's doing monitoring throughout the entire stretch of the St. John's River, has been out there doing um, active sampling and grabs, um, looking for algae blooms. They have spotted a few, but none of them have come back, at least of all of the, the if you look at this um, uh, chart here, which is available on the FDEP, um, sorry, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection website, uh, uh, if you type in algae bloom, you can find this 
um, dashboard. And this dashboard, uh, you can click on the St. John's River, see all the samplings specific to the St. John's River. And then the blue dots are the dots within the last 30 days of where testing and sampling has occurred. You can click on each one visibly see what the the area looks like and then also see if toxins were detected in the sample because again you could see algae and it, it is not um, necessarily toxic and so finding out if it is toxic the level of toxicity and what types of toxins are in it because they all have different potential um, impacts uh, due to that and so um, i'd encourage everyone if you see an algae bloom um, to, uh, to visit this website and to upload a picture of the bloom that you're seeing to the FDEP. Um, next slide, Lisa. And, uh, uh, and, and show them what it is um, that you're seeing and where it was so that they can use that information um, to decide where they're gonna go out and do their testing. But if possible, I'd also love if you would send it to me at St. John's River Keeper, um, because we like to, on these presentations, be able to tell people where our members are seeing and spawning algae blooms. And so just some basic information with that so that we can give accurate information um, is helpful. Next slide. Because the other thing that we do is we actually have water testers, people that are trained, understand how to avoid exposure, but they can get out in the water. We have a, a series of, there are these little um, test strips that we've given people um, that they know how to use the test strip to find out if they see an algae bloom, they can use the strip and find out if toxins are present. If toxins are present, then we can go to that next step to take it to the lab, but it's one um, uh, other little sort of um, uh, helpful step in the process so that if toxins aren't present, um, we don't necessarily have to go to the expense of um, going to the lab. Next slide. So we have water testers throughout the entire St. John's River watershed. And if you're interested in that, then email us and, um, and, and we'll let you know more about that program. Another thing that we're doing right now to talk about how to not feed the algae is um, uh, we have a, a series of videos that are uploaded every Friday where we talk about how to be river friendly at home. And this week we are focusing on composting um, and using worms in your compost. So that'll be very uh, cool that Gabby, our Middle Basin um, uh, Outreach and Education Coordinator is putting together. So tune in. You can either check out our YouTube page where we have a lot of the videos that we've been doing um, uh, recently or on Fridays, we put them up on our Facebook page. So you can see links to the video about how to be more river friendly at home. Next slide. Um, for those of you that tune in regularly, or if this is your first time, we encourage you to become a member of St. John's River Keeper because essentially um, our voice is the voice of all of the people that are members of the organization. We speak um, on behalf of uh, a membership throughout our watershed um, in nearly every county uh, of our watershed, and um, you can become a member at all different levels. It helps support the advocacy work that we do, and we really appreciate those of you that are members right now. If you aren't willing to become a member today, um, then you can shop our store and pick up some merch. Um, I'm in the office today. We can uh, uh, ship it out to you. This is an example of our Don't Feed the Algae t-shirt um, that is a, a great t-shirt to wear when you're out on the boat um, uh, to show other boaters how they can be river friendly on the water or while you're doing yard work at home, maybe in your native uh, landscape and you want your your neighbors to ask how they can um, be a part of the solution and not feed the algae. So um, uh, feel free to check out our website to either become a member or to get more merchandise or to see any of the recordings from our previous webinars on Don't Feed the Algae. All of that is on our website at stjohnsriverkeeper.org. Next slide. And so to finish today, um, I just encourage you all to mark your calendar to register for um, uh, our next Don't Feed the Algae presentation, where we'll focus specifically on the proposed Central Florida water withdrawals and how um, those are connected to growth of algae blooms in the St. John's River. Um, and with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, anyone that's on the call today uh, or, or online today, um, feel free to use the chat window and we'd love to to get to some of your questions and Lisa I'm going to turn over um, our first question to you from Rick Kilby 
He wants to know um, uh, if you are aware, are any of the lost springs in the Ocklawaha River, the 20 lost springs that we talk about, are any of them third magnitude or, sorry, larger than third magnitude? Yeah, I just saw your question, Rick, and thank you. It's good to see your name. Thanks for joining us. And I, yes, there are. Um, I, be, I don't have the exact information. I believe there's two to three that are larger than third magnitude. And so if anyone has that information on the call, if you'll type it in, and we'll definitely provide that information on our website specifically based on the studies of the, the Lost Springs. Um, and that's another question from Rick. Are there any concerns about pollution from Lake Apotka, Harris Chain, lakes making its way into the St. John's if the dam was removed. Um, and, and no, they're, they're, that's the good thing about this project is by doing the restoration of the Akawaha, you actually restore that forested floodplain that provides those biofilters that are so significant um, to water filtration. And so by the, the restoration of the, of the forested floodplain, you increase the water quality filtration that's not being, that we're losing at the moment because those, those forests of wet, wet plants, wetlands are not functioning as properly. There in the, there are studies to that. I'll put there. Um, then let's see from sharing, can you discuss about local resistance to the project? Um, yeah, Sharon, this, this has been a long going issue and, and I know we as well as many others and part of this have met with folks on the other side. And so, you know, when the dam was built in 1968, there was an outcry at that point because the local community did not want the dam. They were very concerned about the cross Florida barge canal destroying fishing on the Okawaha River, destroying fishing on the St. John's, but they felt like it was, it basically was being crammed down their throat. The local community didn't have a say because it was a major federal project. Um, so when the Cross Florida Barge Canal was canceled, by that time the dam was already in place, the pool was there, and it turned into a local amenity and people started going fishing there. There's a nice park on the dam that would actually be restored as part of, of the project. It would be maintained um, but people started going there, it became a fishing destination, and so as a fishing destination, it was um, something that people grew up with. And like I mentioned, you know, if we all grew up fishing there with our grandparents, we'd probably want to protect it too. And if it was a naturally functioning ecosystem, if it was a lake that didn't have to be artificially maintained and cause significant harm like it does, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, but there's a people that they, you know, they have um, a long-standing relationship with, with the pool and they feel now that once again, they're being, you know, they don't have a say and so they've been fighting for it for a long time. They also use the fact that it's an economic driver. I mean, it definitely brings people to the area. Um, and Putnam County, where the dam is located, is one of the poorest counties in the community and in, in the state. And so they are concerned about the loss of economic activity. And that's why there's been significant investment in economic studies um, at the state and federal level that show that the economic activity would actually be offset with the restoration of the Akawaha, but providing enhanced fishing, enhanced opportunities, as well as everyone working on this is really wanting to look at this holistically, is how can we help the local area really benefit and to be not only restore the river, but restore the economy. Um, there's some good news. If you haven't been to downtown Palatka lately, you should definitely go because there is a renaissance of downtown Palatka, which is downstream based on outdoor tourism, um, tourism and fishing. And so there is an opportunity to build on great work of Sam Carr and others on the Bartram Trail that's bringing people to this area, celebrating its natural connection. So while there's definitely local resistance and, and the local solution is part of this ongoing conversation, and that's why it's so important we bring stakeholders together that look at it from a local perspective, but also look at it from a regional perspective. 
Shannon, do you see some other questions you want to? No, I want to thank everyone for joining us and um, and hope that you decide to tune in uh, uh, Wednesday after next for our next presentation. Check out any of the videos from our previous presentation um, and just encourage everyone if you have any follow up questions to shoot us an email, uh, Shannon at stjohnsriverkeeper.org or Lisa at stjohnsriverkeeper.org and we'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Have fun and be safe.